Okay, everyone, for this demo, um, what I'm going to be uh, showing you guys is how to put a foot onto your pinch pot um, if you want to. Not everybody has to, right? Um, so I've got this pinch pot here that I made. You guys saw me make it. It's now at that leather hard stage. This is that stage um, where it's uh, not quite as malleable. I can't really reshape the rim or anything. It's pretty stiff. It's lost that tackiness that we talked about, um, and it has a little bit of a waxy appearance on the clay itself. I don't, it's really hard to kind of show through on video, but um, especially with a light like I have. So, um, and you can notice too that there's still some marks that are on there, and there's nothing wrong with having those marks on there. Also, if you look at the rim as well, the rim is not perfect. There's some little small undulations in it, and that's totally fine. It could be completely um, undulating all the way around if that's what you're looking for, okay? Um, I've got a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about here with the foot, um, because there's a lot of, I mean, there's so many different ways to put a foot on, and there's so many different kinds of feet that are out there. Um, and the whole reason why we even have feet on our objects these days is those feet that are on the bottom of things like a mug or a cup or anything like that or even say a wine glass like the stem of a wine glass is because we end up putting these things on tables. Um, we're making pinch pots. The first pinch pots that were ever made um, potentially could have even been the first objects that were made by man um, out of clay because you didn't really we didn't need tools to do it remember when I was doing this I didn't pull out any tools and start using any tools on anything I was just using my hands when I did that and this was the way that pinch pots are made I've been down in a spot in the Grand Canyon um, on a whitewater rafting trip uh, it, the place is called Nankweep and uh, it's an old village there's an old village site and an old granary site that's there as well and at that old village site, they've got old pot shards that are, uh, that are there, that are from the um, Native Americans that lived in that region. They were ancestral Pueblo uh, Native Americans that lived there um, and made pottery. And uh, the archeologists who excavated that site, they actually ended up leaving a number of these pot shards behind because the only people that can, that can get down there and uh, see these pot shards are rafters and so um, they've got an agreement with the uh, National Park Service that they'll leave those things there and that you can come and you can take a look at them and you can touch them and you can put them back onto the ground but um, you, they're not to leave the canyon um, and so one of the things that's pretty cool about uh, those pinch pots is sometimes you'll find the bottom of an object like this and you'll notice that there's no foot on it right and so this will sit upright but also if i knock it over it'll kind of wobble around right um, well this is the first way that these things were made and the reason why they were made that way is because um, they didn't have tables right so now we've got tables and the whole idea behind a foot is so that that thing can stay stable on a table um, if you've got something like this that's rounded and you live in a place or if you're in a place that has um, just kind of dirt or sand as the ground then what you're able to do is just kind of take this and tamp it down into the sand or into the ground and then it'll stay upright no problem. So um, those first objects that we uh, have find, found in the archaeological record um, are objects that don't have feet. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, one of the things that was the most interesting to me as a ceramic artist and uh, traveling down there is that when you uh, take a look at some of those pot shards and you look at them rather closely. They weren't glazed. They were just, uh, you know, fired in a pretty low temperature firing, um, in a, some something like a, a campfire, uh, similar to a campfire. Anyways, we call it a pit fire these days. Um, and what was really interesting about um, seeing some of that stuff down there is that you could pick up a pot shard and look at it, and you can actually see the fingerprint marks, not just the dents from people uh, making those objects, but you could literally see the fingerprint mark, so the mark of that human being, uh, that specific human being as they were making that pot, um, those sorts of things are retained within the clay, which is pretty cool. Um, so anyways, uh, we're gonna talk about feet, right? Some of you guys are not gonna necessarily make a foot. I've got a portion uh, down here, I've got a really small pinch pot that I made, and I made this small pinch pot because I'm gonna show, just kind of demonstrate uh, how you could put a, a, another style of foot on here. Um, but I made this pinch pot and I flattened out the bottom. And the way that I flattened out that bottom, okay, is that I just took this when it was rounded and I started taking it and pushing it down like so and pressing my finger on the inside. Not when it was at the cheese heart stage, right? But just before the cheese heart stage, maybe even at cheese heart you would be able to do that. All right, so um, 
the reason why I put this or made this one is so that I could show you kind of a couple of different styles of feet because there's so many different ways to put a foot onto an object. But the whole idea is to get something down there that's stable. And this one has a really undulating rim. I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but I'm going to kind of spin it around. It's kind of, it's real um, kind of curvy. And that's not necessarily anything that's going to work out for a foot because if we sit it on the table right here, it just wants to wobble back and forth. Okay, and that's not gonna work out very nicely. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna show you guys how we can cut these things. And if you're really interested in taking and cutting your, the rim on your pinch pot as well, maybe that's something that you want to do to uh, make it a little bit more uh, flat, essentially. So I've got what's called a fettling knife. This is a, a ceramic knife. You could probably, you can find these on Amazon. I've seen them on there. Um, you can also use any kind of a paring knife from your kitchen. And last semester or a couple semesters ago when we went straight into the pandemic, um, I actually made tools at home and I took just a regular knife from uh, a takeout place and I uh, kind of removed, you can see there's this like thick rib, rib right here and then it gets thinner down here because you need a thin knife when you're cutting. And so that's what I did is I took um, just a small uh, knife, you know, like an X-Acto blade or something and got rid of that rib or that ridge. And then I also took some sandpaper and I just sanded down the teeth of this. And when you sand down those teeth, then you get a nice smooth edge and I was able to kind of sharpen it a little bit too. So um, you can use something like this, because remember, we're just using clay. So see, if I come in here and I start doing this, that little, you know, barely sharp knife, just a sharp piece of plastic essentially, starts to cut through that clay. And so I can look and find where my high spots are and I can start to um, kind of get rid of those high spots so that I have a nice flat portion for this um, object to sit on, okay? Um, and you can do that also, like I said, for the rims of your object. If you're really concerned about having a very flat rim and you want that flat rim, then you can come back to that afterwards and you can do the same thing that I'm doing here with a paring knife from the kitchen. Um, and even if you use a paring knife from the kitchen, you know, don't use the nicest knife in the kitchen, but you know, if you use something that, um, you know, the people you live with don't mind you using, um, then uh, you know it just you don't want it to really be you don't want it to be serrated or anything you just want it to have um, a, sh a good sharpness and you want it to be relatively thin an exacto blade works really well for this as well and one of the cool things about this too so you guys can see is that when i cut these things off they come off in like curls like curled up pieces of chocolate um, that's going to happen in the just before cheese hard stage it's going to happen in the leather or sorry the cheese hard stage and the leather hard stage. In the leather hard stage, they don't come off quite as big as this, okay? So um, that's essentially one of the things that we can, um, or that's why when we cut things up, when we do any sort of carving, we wanna do that at around the cheese hard stage to the leather hard stage. Anything past leather hard is way too late. And now I'm just take, coming and I'm taking my fingers and I'm just using my fingers right here and I'm kind of softening up that sharper edge that was created when I started to um, manipulate that with the knife, right? As I cut it, it left a sharp edge and I wanted to have a nice soft edge. Any kind of sharp edges that touch the table, if we put them on there kind of crooked as we're setting them down, sometimes those sharp edges will actually chip off after these pieces have been uh, fired in the kiln. And so it becomes kind of a vulnerable spot for the objects. Uh, so what you want to do is kind of soften things up like what I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of pinching a little bit, but I'm pinching on the sharp edges with my fingers really close together here. And I can even kind of come through here and um, rub it as well. And when I rub it, it'll actually start to soften things up a little bit as well also. Um, and this is not quite at the cheese hard stage. It's almost cheese hard. It's just before it. Uh, maybe another 10, 15 minutes out on a good warm day and it probably would be at that cheese hard stage. But it's a good workable level right now. Like I could pinch it a little bit thinner if I wanted to. I could, um, I theoretically could start carving it right now. Um, and sometimes it's good to start doing that a little bit earlier. Um, so now I'm gonna take this and put it on the table and just kind of tap it down like this. And when I do that, it ensures that it's gonna be a nice flat Okay, base, all right? So that's kind of what I've got going on. Um, now, this could be a foot, okay? This could also be another pinch pot. 
you know, if we're uh, making items that are maybe going to be like nesting dolls and that's our relationship, then maybe we want to do something like this, right? This would maybe be the smallest one. This is a really small pinch pot. I don't want you guys making pinch pots that are quite that small. I've got another one that's right here as well that's about like kind of medium size, somewhere between these, all right? And if I look at these objects, all right, they don't necessarily relate to one another like we talked about with this relationship project. Um, this one's got tall walls that it comes up. This one's got shorter walls. The proportions aren't quite the same. It's not quite as deep. Um, this is a quite a deep kind of piece, as you can see, right, when we put them next to each other. Um, and it, this one just kind of flares out and then, and then continues um, on, whereas this one kind of comes up and then it comes into a vertical wall. So that's where this would not necessarily relate to that. What I'm gonna use this one for is to show you guys how to do the deconstruction reconstruction, but I'm still waiting on it to get a little bit stiffer uh, so that we can get to that point, all right? Now, if I was gonna take this, I could take this and put that down there and have this go on top of it and create a foot like so, right? And that's a really dramatic foot, okay? And if I was to do something like that, Okay, what I would wanna do is because I have a flat spot here, I would wanna make a flat spot here as well, but I don't need to do that because of the foot, the other foot that I'm gonna show you, okay? Or the other couple feet that I'm gonna show you. Um, so that I just kinda of put there as, um, you know, uh, something to uh, think about and uh, potentially do for your foot if that's what you're interested in doing, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna show you guys how to do is uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make this into a coil slash pinch or a coil pinch, I would call it, um, foot. Uh, so I'm gonna be rolling out a coil and then I'm going to be putting that coil together so it creates a donut. And then we're gonna be uh, scoring and slipping and putting it onto our pinch pot. Um, I'm also gonna, in this, at the same time, because I'm making a coil, I'm gonna make a kind of tripod foot and show you what that tripod foot would look like. Okay. One thing to remember about this kind of a foot is that it's, it is a little bit vulnerable because it's, it's a dynamic foot. It, it's quite small that's here. The connection where it connects onto the pot itself is pretty small. And so we just want to be careful with those. If we're doing anything like that, we want to be very careful with uh, move, moving those objects around. You know, for example, coming and dropping them off at school. Um, when they get to that bone dry stage, which they eventually will get to that bone dry stage because as soon as we're done making these objects, we're gonna leave them out to dry. We'll talk about that at the end of this demo as well. Um, but uh, having this small, it's only about the size of a quarter. Um, having that small of a connection, um, it, it becomes pretty fragile in the dry stage, okay? Um, and the dry stage or the bone dry stage is the most fragile portion of, or the most fragile time that your clay is gonna be in. All right, so you just want to be careful with those things. Um, so I've got an, uh, a piece of clay here, and this piece of clay, I cut it off the clay block so that it would be more like a rectangular prism, okay? I used my wire tool when I did that. I didn't cut it off in a block like, a, like I did for my pinch pot because I'm gonna just turn this into a long coil. And if I wanna turn something into a long coil, this rectangular prism kind of shape where it's longer um, and, and skinnier uh, rather than like a cube, makes it easier for me to uh, roll this thing out, squeeze it out and then roll it out into a, uh, into a coil. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna put it in my hand and I'm just gonna squeeze it in my hand and I'm gonna turn it into kind of like a branch or a log. And what this does is it rounds out all those squared off edges and that's important, okay? Cause it's gonna make it easier for me to actually roll this object out, just squeezing this, okay? That's all we're doing. We want fresh clay from the bag. Uh, the other thing we want to do is on the ends, anytime we make a coil, you, on the ends we want to kind of pinch them a little bit and make them kind of pointy. And the reason why we want to do that is because we don't want the clay to fold over onto itself on its end and create an air pocket. If we create air pockets, any kind of air pockets we get in clay potentially can cause the clay to explode when it goes into the kiln. Now it's not a violent explosion, it just means that it's gonna pop apart and you won't have a piece left anymore. Uh, so we don't want to get any of those sorts of, we don't want air to be trapped inside of clay. And also we would never wanna take two pinch pots like that and put them together and trap air inside. Um, if we do something like this and put two objects together, we can do that, but then we have to somewhere put an air hole. And it could be as small as just one single needle poked into it, right? This needle, our needle that we use for ceramics, not 
like a sewing needle. Those might be a little bit too small and it might close up in the process. So just this needle tool that you have in your toolkit. So I've got that one out here waiting as well. All right. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take my hand and I'm going to put my hand on top of the clay and I want to have my hand parallel to the table and I want to start to roll this like so. And I want to roll all the way from my fingers, okay, here, all the way into my palm, okay? I don't want to just use this for front portion and, and, and do this. This is not moving a lot of the clay, okay? I call this like DJ scratching, you know, eater, 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 right? Um, so you want to roll this through. You see how I can roll it through all the way and I'm applying a little bit of pressure as I do that, okay? And sometimes we'll get some spots where it'll kind of start to make some noise and it'll have make like a, like, a little like duh, 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 noise. And if we and that happens, I've got it happening right here on this end. I'm gonna move it up onto the high spot, tap it down just a little bit so it becomes more of a square. So it's not so, uh, the, the shape of it is a little bit different. Okay, do that again. And then I start rolling my coil out, okay? With me, when I roll coils, sometimes if I roll them too slowly, it kind of messes up my messes up my roll, slows my roll. All right. I got to go a little bit quicker. Okay, and now I've got a nice coil. Um, you want to be careful of any folds that fold over on you, right? I've got a little bit of a fold right here, and so I can kind of just manipulate that if I need to. Okay, but what we're going for here is we're going for kind of an even thickness of this coil throughout. Right? It's a little bit less on these sides, but that's okay because what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually uh, change the, um, the the length of this. I don't need that. I don't need it to be this long. Okay. So I'm going to be creating a donut out of this, and then we're going to be putting that donut together, and then we're going to be putting it on there. Now, when I cut this, this is kind of an important thing too. I have an option that I could cut it this way, cut it on a 90 degree angle from the the long portion of it. Right. And that'll be okay, it'll work out okay, but it's actually better to cut it on an angle, like a, about a 45 degree angle, all right? I'm gonna uh, change the camera angle here so you guys can kind of see this from the top angle because I think it'll help you out. Okay, so now I can come in here and I wanna cut this on um, a diagonal, like about a 45 degree angle. So I'm gonna cut that down. And this is one of the nice things about this kind of fettling knife tool or even like an X-Acto blade. Right? The one thing that's cool about the fettling knife is that it's it's like a butter knife kind of. It's not it's not sharp, right? And you could do the same thing with something like this, the plastic knife tool. Okay. Um, so there we go. We've got that set to go. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start manipulating this into a circle. And I want to I want to pull my piece over here. I want to see where this is going to line up on my work, right? And the place that I put it, right? I don't want to put it way out here. If I put it way out here, then this part is gonna to be too high, and that's gonna to touch the table. So we wanna make sure that we bring it inwards and make it wide enough that it's really nice and sturdy um, and not too narrow. If we go too narrow on this object, then it makes it a little bit difficult for everything to go together, okay? If it's too narrow, then it becomes even more uh, dynamic of a foot than this little piece, right? And then it's not gonna be very stable on the table. It's gonna be like standing on one foot on your with your body rather than being on two feet with your body okay so uh, we get that kind of lined up and now i've got to make that diagonal cut again right so i think about where that is okay and i'm going to make that diagonal cut i'm going to pull it down to the board so i don't make any sort of marks on my object right I think it was probably somewhere around here. We can adjust it if need be. And so one thing that's great about this is you see how it's this, this 45 degree angle. When we put that together, the 45 degree angle has way more surface area connecting it, okay, than if it was just um, a straight cut, a 90 degree cut, okay? Um, in uh, woodworking, they call that a butt joint when you have just 90 degree angles that meet each other. Um, and this is uh, a bevel cut, okay? So this is gonna be a lot stronger as we do this, okay? I'm gonna double check and see like size-wise how I did, right? I'm also looking at this from this angle and thinking about the dynamic that I'm gonna get from um, having this object on the table, right? I'm gonna be able to pinch this up a little bit taller, which will be nice, okay? Um, and that looks about right, all right? That looks like it'll work out for me proportion-wise. We don't wanna go too wide because then we miss out on this whole nice kind of um, 
uh, dynamic kind of curve that's there. And maybe, maybe I'm gonna go slightly smaller than that. I want it a little bit smaller. So it cuts in a little bit more and gives me a little bit more of a dynamic. There we go, All right, like so, okay? Now, there's a couple different ways that you can uh, do the next step, which is called scratching and slipping, right? Or scoring and slipping, but scoring, scratching is just another word for uh, scratching. I made this last semester, and what this is is just a cork, and then I've put a bunch of, or four, um, uh, toothpicks that have been cut off and I used my a needle tool or I used something I can't remember what I used actually to poke into that maybe I even used uh, just the other end of this um, uh, this toothpick and pushed it in there so what I've done is created myself uh, made myself a scoring tool or a scratching tool so what I can do with this if I want to which makes it a lot easier this is like four needle tools in one right when I scratch I can go like this and it makes four scratches at once okay See that? Rather than just having a single scratch. So when I go to scratch, I can scratch really quickly like this because you really want to mess up that uh, clay layer, all right? So whatever is going to connect, you really want to make it a mess, okay? You want to scratch it over and over and over again. You don't just want to make a cross-hatched pattern. You can see that I went in multiple directions when I did this. That's important, okay? I'm gonna do the same thing to this, but notice that I haven't extended this out all the way into a straight um, object again. So I'm gonna kind of leave it here. I don't wanna bend it too many times. If I bend it too many times, then it becomes a, a problem, all right? So I'm gonna scratch that like so. You notice that I'm kind of holding, using my fingers to support everything while I'm doing this so it's not flopping all over the place and moving all over the place. So look at how nice and um, scratched each one of those surfaces is, okay? Really nice and scratched, okay? There's no clay that's there that I can see that's in the same cut form. It's all been manipulated and all been scratched up, all right? That's super important for scratching, okay? In the scratching and slipping. now. There's a couple of things that we can do. I've actually made myself some slip and I've just used like an old salsa container. Um, and what this is, is clay that's had at water added to it. And one of the things you can do is all these little bits of clay that you have left over that are really not useful any longer. We can drop those down in here like this. We can start to mix them up a little bit. This is actually some pretty good um, consistency slip right now. So it doesn't really need a lot more uh, clay in it. You want it to kind of have the uh, consistency of like a super soft cream cheese or maybe even like a yogurt. Uh, but if I do this and I move those in there and get them into that, um, into that slip again, then they'll start to take on some moisture. And uh, originally when I made this, I did the same thing. I put a bunch of those things in there, little small crumbs of clay, and then I added some water and I let it sit for maybe you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes until um, a lot of that water was absorbed by the clay and then I used something to kind of mix it up and really get it moving around, all right? So this is slip and what we can do with slip is we can apply slip onto um, these scratched areas to get it on there, right? And this is one of the better ways to connect objects is by using a slip and just using that excess clay that we have that we're probably gonna end up throwing away anyways. Those little crumbs are not really good for anything after um, after they come off like uh, like I, the way that I pulled them off, all right? Um, and sometimes for small connections like this, I do it a little bit differently. And I don't use slip, I'll just use saliva. Um, there's saliva works better than um, than using um, than using just uh, just water, okay? Um, and I'll show you kind of how I do that in just a moment. But I mean, you can get the idea. You need to add some moisture there. But the whole idea behind doing the scratching and slipping like this is that we need to have moisture here after we scratch. We get the moisture on there, and then we're going to scratch it again in just a moment, okay? Um, so. Um, now I'm gonna go and take my scratching tool, or this time I'm just gonna use my needle tool just so you guys can see how to scratch with the needle tool in case you don't have supplies to be able to make something like that. Um, I had a uh, uh, student in the class too that used straight pins um, to do this, to make something similar to this. And it doesn't even have to be a cork, it just has to be something that can hold on to those, um, those pieces. Um, you can also buy one of those tools on uh, Amazon for about five bucks. Um, so, 
Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back in here and I'm gonna scratch again. Now I scratched in one direction. I'm gonna come and do in, in the opposite direction or at least one more direction so I really kind of start to work up a nice consistency of slip and wet clay there in this interface between the bag clay that's right here and the area that's gonna be connected. And so I'm gonna do that to this side as well. And you can see it just takes a little bit longer if we're using the needle tool um, for something small like this. It takes a bit longer if I'm putting together another object. So now those pieces are all good and ready to go. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take them and put them together and I'm gonna push and wiggle. And as I push and wiggle, see I'm just kind of wiggling side to side, just barely. I'll actually feel them start to lock into place and some of that stuff, a lot of that stuff oozed out, okay? I want that to happen. If you don't get that stuff oozing out, you're probably trying to connect dry pieces, right? Or you didn't add enough moisture. You want that to occur, right? We can also wait a little bit as this starts to stiffen up before we start to kind of manipulate it together to get rid of that seam. Um, but you know, pushing and wiggling is really the, the key to getting these uh, objects to stay together. Uh, this is gonna allow them to stay together once they get fired, okay? Now, another foot that I just wanna mention, I'm not gonna show you guys how to make this foot per se, um, but I'm just gonna kind of give you an idea, is to do something like a tripod foot. Uh, tripod feet work out a little bit better than using four feet. And the reason why is because they tend to stay upright um, a little bit easier. That's why um, in, in, in the kiln, sometimes things warp and so it'll kind of be wobbly when it comes out if you use four legs, unless you're real good, okay? It is possible to do something like that, but it's kind of difficult to pull off. It's even hard for me to pull it off. Uh, but sometimes for things like a, a a butter dish or something like that, we have to have four feet, right? So let's say that we can make three of these, okay? This is kind of on the skinnier side of things for me to be able to use as a tripod foot, but it, it would kind of work. And what I could do is I could take this and I could put this onto the base here, and then I put another one here and another one here, and then it sits upright on that tripod, okay? One thing I want us to notice is that if I did put this on like, like this, look, you see the angle of that, um, that foot? it's angled the wrong way, so it's gonna be up on a point, okay? So what you would have to do is come in here and manipulate that little foot and get it to be on a little bit of an angle, okay? So that way when it goes on to the base, then it has a flatter foot that would sit flat onto the ground, okay? You kind of see how that's now on a little bit of a bias. Okay, so um, that's how we would do something like that. And we could put feet around this. We could even put 15 feet around that if we wanted to. It's, not, it's up to you as the maker as to what you want to do, okay? Um, so now that all that's happened, if you have any little bits of clay that are like this that are still wet, um, you can put them right back into your clay bag. Um, and if you need to add a little bit of moisture to them, one of the things I do is I'll get just a Ziploc since we're at home, you know? Normally in the studio, I do it a little bit differently, but then I could put them in here like this, and then I could get a sponge, right? This is a little natural sponge. I can get this sponge and add some water to it um, from the sink, and then put it in there kind of really wet and just kind of slide it into the bag and keep it in there and zip lock it, right? And then that little sponge can start to add a little bit of moisture. We're kind of creating a little bit of a rainforest inside of this bag. Um, so I've got a lot of little pieces that I've kind of pulled off of stuff um, that are in there, okay? And now we've waited just a little bit of time, not too long, but just a little bit. And what I can now do is I can start to kind of manipulate this clay. So I'm gonna kind of come in here and kind of pull some of it off, right? I get some of it off on my finger and that stuff can just go right into our little slip container because it's already kind of wet clay and we can stir it up a little bit later. And if it gets a little bit too thick, we can go back in later and we can, um, and we can add a little bit of moisture if we need to, okay? So I've done that, and now I'm just gonna kind of pinch that a little bit as I'm kind of applying pressure as well. And if I do that, I can really kind of start to get rid of that seam. And if it doesn't seem like your finger drags nicely, I've kind of gotten used to um, dragging my finger across pretty, you know, dryish clay, if you will. But one thing you can do is just, um, I just licked my finger a little bit and added a little bit of saliva to my finger. It's my own saliva, so it's no big deal. Um, and that can actually allow you to um, drag your finger across a little bit easier. It kind of adds to um, 
it adds a little bit of lubrication essentially there, right? And see, I keep compressing that together, that compression or pushing those two spots together, that's gonna help this thing stay together nicely, especially when it's getting fired. Sometimes we make work and if we don't put things together properly, once they go into the kiln, um, they can actually uh, get cracks in their vulnerable spots, like where two pieces were put together, for example. All right, so I like to do a lot of compression and drag that and really make it make that kind of um, interface where those two pieces went together. I like to make that disappear. If I can make that disappear, it's going to be really nice in the firing and it's going to stay together really well as long as it dries nicely. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is get my pinch pot and I'm going to set that on top of my pinch pot and kind of take a look as to where that's going. I'm gonna pull my needle tool out and I'm gonna use my needle tool just real gently and I'm gonna kind of draw a little bit of a circle on the inside and on the outside. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna give me a spot. It's gonna show me where I need to do that scratching or that scoring, okay? So now when I pull it off, we can see that there's some marks that are there. I'm gonna hold it a little bit closer to the camera. You can see those marks that are there, okay? And that gives me an idea as to where I need to do that scratching, okay? So now I'm gonna come back to this and I'm gonna use my scratching tool or you can use your needle tool. This is where the scratching tool comes in handy because we've got a, we got a little bit of space that we have to cover, right? And if you go outside of the lines, don't worry about it, right? Um, what can happen is when you go to actually put this whole thing together, some of that clay is gonna ooze out a little bit. I'm going in another direction now, right? So I don't just get one direction, I get a couple of different directions in that scratching, right? Um, so uh, when I push down and I get that kind of oozing of clay, then that oozing is going to, um, is gonna squish some clay out of there. And that, that little squished out clay, I can use my finger and manipulate it and push it into all those little um, you know, nooks and crannies that might be there, all right? So now I'm gonna scratch on the other side because just like I did with the donut when I was making this object, you gotta do it on both sides. So I get that scratching on both sides. And then what do I need to do now? If you thought in your head moisture, that's what we need to do. We can either use our slip or we can use saliva. Um, in a larger surface area like this, it's a little bit easier in most cases to kind of use the slip. Um, those little pieces have been in there for a good amount of time now. So if I give it a good stir, right, I can kind of get rid of some of those chunks that might be in there uh, from that those newer pieces that I uh, put inside, right? But I'm gonna get some of this slip. You can also use a, um, a paintbrush, um, like a really small paintbrush to get some of this on there. All right, and we just wanna get it, it adds moisture, it adds, uh, it gets all into those little nooks and crannies of all the scratches. You can see that I'm kind of destroying all the scratches here. That's fine, all right? You're like, but Brian, why did we even do that? It's because when we make those scratches, those scratches actually go deeper down in. It's not just a really, minor surface scratch. You can see, hopefully you can see how kind of deep those scratches are that are there, right? Okay, oh, that's too close, it's out of focus. Um, and so they're pretty deep. You don't wanna put just like, you know, you don't wanna do this like, ooh, scratch, scratch, barely, right? You need to get in there and you need to get some scratches in there uh, because what this is doing is it's creating an interface. It's, um, it's making the clay where all that scr the scratches are, it's making that portion of the clay a little bit more wet. It's adding some moisture to it. And then I'm gonna scratch it up again and make it uh, essentially have some teeth. And then I'm gonna squeeze those two objects together. And when I do that, it's kind of like locking things in place and it prepares a, the, the right surface for these objects to get put together. Now, um, later on in your life, way later than beginning ceramics, I mean, I, I have seen some people um, that don't even do the scratching part. They just do the, the score or they just do the slip part. Um, but they're, they're very honed in on what it is that they're doing for their craft. 
and they know exactly what dryness level each one of those two objects is. And if you do it right, you can actually, it, it can actually work out for you. But if you do it wrong, it'll break every time, okay? Uh, as either as it's drying or as it's in the kiln. So you gotta be careful of those things. I'm putting a lid on my slip because I don't need it any longer. Uh, that keeps the moisture inside. So right now being beginners, like I still scratch and slip everything because it, it gives, it's kind of like an insurance policy. It gives me a nice insurance policy to let me know as the maker that when I put that thing into the kiln, that it's going to come out and I'm not going to have cracks in my, in my uh, connections, on my connections, all right? So one direction, we're going to go in another direction and really kind of scratch that up. We're going to do the same thing. You'll get some kind of oozy stuff that happens on your uh, scratching tool if you're using one like this. Um, so what you can do is I'm going to reopen actually my slip container and just kind of drop some of that in there, all right? And now I'm going to come back to this part and I'm gonna scratch this in one direction, and then I'm gonna come back in a second direction. There we go, one direction and two direction. That just really makes sure that we've gotten everything, okay? If you've gotten like some extra here, we can kind of pull some off. That's gonna make a lot of, a lot of ooze. Um, the other thing is sometimes people don't get the oozing happening and that's because they maybe didn't apply enough moisture or they didn't apply enough slip. So those could be two things, okay? Um, now these two surfaces are ready. So I could take this and place it on there. And then what's the next step? What do I need to do? Do I just push down on it and we're, just, oh, we're ready to go? Nope, what we need to do is hold on to this very gently and we're gonna kind of push and wiggle. You notice that I'm kind of wiggling it side to side here. And it's really cool, as you're doing this, you can actually feel that clay as you're wiggling it. You can actually feel it start to lock into place and you can see some of the oozing happening. So I'm gonna go around and wiggle all these on the outside edge as well as we come around here. Bam, okay. And now, because I told you guys that I was gonna do a pinch coil, there's nothing wrong with just putting a coil on like this, but I like to do a, a coil and then pinch that coil because it gives me a little bit um, taller foot and it'll bring the foot back into um, a little bit thinner than it is right now. So it's about the same thickness as the object itself. So um, that'll just kind of make sure that it dries kind of evenly. So now I'm just gonna kind of come around here and I'm gonna squeeze this and pinch it just so gently. And remember that rhythmic pinching that we talked about in the pinch pot demo, right? Making sure that I'm pinching the same amount each and every time as I go around. That rhythmic nature of pinching is gonna help us out quite a bit as makers. And really starting to gain a sensitivity as to how much clay is in between our fingers. The more that we hold clay and the more we pinch it and the more we move it around within our fingers, the better we're gonna get at understanding how much clay is between there. Our brain starts to realize it and starts to say, hey, I know that portion that I'm squeezing right now is about the same thickness as that other portion that's there. And then you come to a spot and you're like, ooh, wait, right here it feels a little bit a little bit on the thicker side, so I need to squeeze a little bit more there to thin it out and bring it back to the same. Um, I can see my connection right here, so I'm just gonna kinda do a little bit more of a compression in that one spot. And I can even manipulate this and kinda squeeze it inwards like this to bring that back in because it's kinda started to pinch out. You can also flare your feet too, right? So right now I've got like a pretty flat foot, right? It kinda goes straight. Um, but I can also um, change that up and I can make it to be a little bit of a flared foot. I haven't done a flared foot in a while, so maybe I'll flare this out a little bit. So now I'm just pinching a little bit more, just like we talked about with the pinch pot. If we want to flare it out, we're just kind of, I can squeeze a little bit more with my top finger and lower down the other finger that's on the outside and that can start to kind of move that clay outward, all right? start to give it a nice kind of flare all right there we go now I've got this kind of messed up area that's right in here from all that ooze okay if you kind of see it it's not really it doesn't look very nice okay so what I can do is I can come here with my fingers and I can just drag down from the foot into the form okay and again if I need a little bit of moisture just a light touch 
Um, if you don't want to use your saliva, you can get a small little, another little container like this uh, slip container, you know, whatever kind of a container you have at home. And you can um, add a little bit of water into it and water will work for this too, okay? I used to tell all my elementary students that we're just little moisture factories. We have moisture in our mouth all the time, so I don't, and I'm a big guy, or I'm, a, um, mm -hmm. I'm big into conserving water. I know it's little, little amounts of water at a time, but um, doing that and using just um, your saliva instead, I don't know how many gallons that is at the end of the year. I can also use this and start to kind of manipulate my finger around, okay? Make it look a little bit prettier down there. Now that's starting to look a little bit better. We don't see that crack that we used to see, okay? This is craftsmanship, okay? Leaving it with all that oozy clay all over the place, that's kind of poor craftsmanship, unless that's part of your aesthetic. But that didn't look very, very nice, right? Um, there's ways to use that kind of slip ooze that might look kind of cool. And if you can figure that out, then go for it, right? But the way that it looked before, it just looked like it wasn't really finished, right? It looks like somebody forgot to do that portion of it. You know, it's kind of like if somebody was building a house and they just started breaking boards instead of cutting them with the saw, that would look kind of weird, unless that was part of the aesthetic and they did it everywhere, right? And if it was done everywhere, then it becomes part of the look of that object or of that, um, in that case, that, arc, that piece of architecture architecture mm -hmm. and that could be interesting but we just want to try and make these things look as nice as possible and then I've got the same thing going on that's down here right um, so I need to take a look at that and I need to kind of manipulate that and sometimes what I like to do down for that little spot is um, I like to pull out like a wooden knife tool or something like that and get down there or sometimes I even use like a rounded tool here um, and I can take this and kind of just kind of give it a little bit of a rocker on there. And it starts to kind of flatten out that um, portion of the foot, right? And kind of gives it an interesting look. Um, I would then come to this and start to manipulate it as well, right? So there's just so many different ways that we can do that. We can also make it look like the foot is part of that. So we can start to actually use our, just this portion of our finger. And if you watch how that finger kind of drags, as long as you don't have long nails, right? I tend to keep my nails, um, at a point where the nail doesn't extend past the end of the finger. And then if, I'm, if I do this, like my finger is one of the best smoothing tools that I really have available to me. Plus it allows me to have my hands on my object. And I like that kind of tactile feeling, that tactile um, portion of, of ceramics is doing this kind of stuff and actually getting your fingers uh, and hands dirty in the process. And, you know, doing something like this and kind of getting rid of that seam, making it seem like, making it seem, uh -huh. making it look like that foot just kind of grows off of that object. That's kind of cool, right? Um, and then you can flare it to whatever flare I kind of want to have happening here. And just looking at it from the side, it'll give me a good idea what I want to do. And then there becomes a point in time if you're using just uh, moisture for your fingers and uh, that this kind of stuff starts to happen and you get these little crumbs all over your uh, fingers. Those don't work very well for smoothing. So what you may wanna do is have some sort of a, um, kind of an old rag around so you can kind of get rid of that stuff and a little bit damp and that's gonna be better because you remember we don't wanna have a lot of airborne dust if we haven't talked about that already, I'm going to take the time to talk about it really quickly one more time. Um, and uh, that is that uh, clay is non-toxic in the wet form, but when it's dry and it's dust, that's when it becomes harmful. So I, I'm really careful when I do things like this. And I really just kind of, I don't really try and manipulate it too much and make it um, fly up in the air, right? Um, and then later, like, you know, I just kind of get the crumbs out of the way for now. And then eventually I'll come back and I'll use a sponge to clean up everything. Because that wet sponge is going to um, be a lot better for, that, uh, for keeping down the dust, right? And if you can work outside, there's nothing wrong with working outside. There's a little bit better ventilation outside. But that doesn't mean that you're off the hook and you, you don't have to worry about silica any longer. It can still get into your lungs if you're 
working outside. So we just want to be careful. And we want to use, we want to clean up using water, not using a broom, okay? A little hand broom or a bigger broom, right? So now that pinch potter is pretty much done, okay? We can see that it's got a nice foot on it, right? And so then if I take this and I sit it upright, I want to make sure that it's flat, okay? Um, and uh, it's at this point, if I want to do any decoration, like we watch those surface decoration videos, if we want to do any carving, maybe we wait a, wait a little bit longer until this portion's dried up a bit, um, and then we can start to do any sort of carving or anything like that that we want to um, apply. Um, but this being in this le almost leather hard stage, just past a, a little past cheese hard, it's a great consistency right now. And remember that once this passes leather hard, you can't apply a foot, okay, right? Things can be applied to the side of objects, right? This is not necessarily a good example, right? Because it doesn't look like a handle, but we could add a handle as well in, in any way, shape, or form, okay? Um, so that's how we put a foot onto an object. And again, not all of you guys are going to make a foot, and that's okay. Um, but we're probably going to be making a foot at some point on some object during the class period or during the class uh, this semester. So just kind of understanding how those feet work and putting on a something like this, which we would call a foot ring. Um, I can come back to it too. It's dried up a little bit now and I can kind of manipulate this and work on my craftsmanship a little bit better so I don't see tooling marks, so I don't see finger marks, whatever it is that you want to do, okay? Unless those marks are a part of the aesthetic of the object that you're making, all right? So the very last thing that we want to do when we make an object is we're going to want to put our name on this object. That's how we're going to be able to tell whose it is when it goes into the kiln and comes out of the kiln. And even though we're working at home, we're going to be doing some drop-off portions where we can actually fire these things. And so we want to write our name in there. Um, I do not like to use the needle tool to write uh, your name because if you use this thin of a tool, it's going to be very difficult for you to read your name. And the glaze is, if when we put any glaze or anything on it, um, it's not going to actually show through very easily. Okay, so I can use this uh, to show you. And you may have seen this on one of the carving demonstrations too, is that if you use something like um, the end, like this is just a chopstick that I um, kind of sharpened a little bit. Um, and so if I take this and I move this into the clay, you can see what a nice mark it gives, right? Um, if I take the needle tool and I do the same thing, it gives a mark, but look at how much thinner that is, okay? That's a much thinner mark and it's gonna be harder to read your name when it happens, okay? So what we wanna do for our, our, um, our pieces is we wanna put, I'm just gonna do it on this so you can see it a little bit easier. I'm gonna put my first initial, so I'm gonna put a B, and then I'm gonna put my whole last name. All right, and when we do this, these little crumbs show up, okay? Leave those little crumbs. Don't even try and do anything with them, because watch, if I try and do something with it right now, sometimes that actually worked, but sometimes they get stuck inside and sometimes they actually stick back to the object, okay? But if the clay is at the, dry, at the right dryness level, sometimes we're able to actually do that. We can wait till it gets bone dry even to do that. So you want those things to be able to come off. See, some of it actually stuck inside of here and that's not actually great, okay? So you just wanna be careful about that. Don't do it when it's wet. When it's wet, it's the worst, okay? Um, so first initial, you know, if you want to get a period in there, you can. Um, and full last name. Make sure you're not going all the way through your object. Okay? So that's how we're going to be marking all of our work this semester. Cool? So one last thing I'm going to show you guys. And that is how this thing sits on the table. And what we want to look at is we want to take a look here on this portion, the base of this object, and make sure that we have this piece sitting on a very flat portion of the ground or the table and I'm going to kind of I can tap it down a little bit like this and that flattens everything down here to make sure that the whole foot is touching and then I can actually get my kind of head down here and look and make sure that it's that it's flat right if it's kind of on a curved side then maybe I want to manipulate it a little bit and from me having this thing um, 
sitting upside down while I was doing all that. I've got some flat spots here with some sharp bits, so I can just come back here, and this is why it's nice to do this when it's cheese hard, is because I can still come back here and manipulate it. If it was full on leather hard right now, it's just kind of barely leather hard, or right before leather hard, I can actually um, kind of smooth this portion out. I can come back with a sponge, but the sponge pen can be kind of dangerous. If I come in here and start trying to smooth something out with the sponge, if there's any sort of grit, sand, or grog in your clay, then when you use a sponge, the sponge will pull up the clay particles and it'll leave the sand behind. And so you'll actually start to round your, uh, your rim, but what it's actually doing too is it's making it rougher. So then the spot where we're gonna drink the last bit of the cereal or the soup or the melted ice cream out of this little bowl, um, then we're gonna be putting our lips onto a surface that feels sandy rather than feeling nice and smooth. And it's much nicer to put your um, mouth on nice smooth objects, okay? Think about all the items that you have in your um, cupboard at home or that you use on a regular basis and they don't have real rough rims they don't have real sharp rims. They're nice and smooth and flat, okay? So that's just something to think about, all right? So there we have it. Small little uh, pinch pot with a foot on the bottom. We can see that it has this nice dynamic as it kind of comes down here and has this undercut as it goes into the foot and then a nice little flared foot down below. It's quite sturdy, okay? Um, and if I'm gonna make a second and a third piece that relate to this, there's a lot of different ways I can do that, but I can essentially treat them the same. Think about the proportions that are here. I can make one that's slightly smaller, another one that's slightly bigger, and then we have this gradation of as they come up. Relationship doesn't mean that they're all three exactly the same. That's not what it means, okay? I've had a student before that made items that related to one another, and the way that they related is that they were all geometric shapes. And so um, when you looked at them, the one at the bottom, they were kind of nesting pieces. The one at the bottom was a square. Um, the one inside of that one was a circle. And then the one inside of the circle was a triangle. And they were all treated very similarly, completely different pieces, but they appeared as though they related because of the way that the student treated those objects and used that kind of theme of a geometric shape. So if you have any questions about relationship, please ask me. I'm more than happy to help. We can figure things out together.